Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I actually uh, changed the title slightly, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I also would like to uh, start thanking uh, you know, the organizers to uh, invite me, and in particular uh, th uh, saying thank you uh, to uh, Boris. I think uh, you know, everyone has a story about Boris, and I have many stories about Boris. I will only share one because uh, uh, my time is limited, and uh, I always go over time. And therefore, uh, one story is that uh, when I was a student uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Zurich, uh, you know, there was a seminar given on uh, weak localization, mesoscopic effects. Uh, this was uh, quite many years ago. And I remember very vividly uh, when then my uh, PhD advisor came to me and said, these are the papers you need to study. These are the papers and the work you have to start to work on it. And I started to look into it and said, that's impossible. I mean, this has been written by a man, you know, who must be a senior, uh, very, very senior scientist. And it turned out uh, it was Boris. And I think, you know, I, I pictured him at that time as someone uh, doing a work like this, uh, being at the age he is now. And so uh, basically, it's very fair to say that uh, Boris has achieved so many things in, uh, in our field in, uh, in science that uh, basically he should have twice the biological age at least he has now. So Boris, uh, congratulations to your birthday. Uh, thank you very much. You influenced my uh, career path uh, a lot. So <coughs> uh, my talk here is actually basically a continuation of what we've heard in the first uh, talk and also in uh, uh, Leo's talk, so I might uh, uh, maybe rush uh, over a few things a little bit. Okay, so I also want to talk about my runners and maybe if there's time also about uh, some other uh, excitations. I acknowledge uh, my collaborators and uh, in particular uh, Elena Klinovaya, she is now also uh, in Basel faculty. So the outline here, uh, I will spend a little bit on uh, motivation because I think it's also important to know about the, uh, you know, the prospects of uh, topological quantum computing, which is based on uh, Majorana fermions. <coughs> and then go to nanowires, atom chains, and maybe say something about this. Uh, the last part certainly I will not reach. So in quantum computing, we have basically these days uh, two choices. Uh, you can go the uh, conventional way, as it uh, uh, might uh, be called now, basically using qubits uh, based on two-level systems and manipulate them. Manipulate them to a very high degree, uh, changing, for, uh, changing, for example, the direction of a spin by a certain angle, and this has to be very precise. And of course, uh, such uh, schemes are very prone to uh, errors, and therefore the error issue has be, is a very, very important uh, issue in uh, quantum computation. You need to understand how to improve on that and whether it's actually a principal problem or not. And in the beginning of quantum computation, that was a principal issue because it was not clear that you can actually correct an error in a quantum system because uh, for this you need to know. You need to measure. When you measure, you collapse the state. You destroy it, actually. But with some clever scheme, it could be extended, and it's possible to do error correction. <clears throat> Still, there are thresholds. If the error rate is too high, then uh, you will actually succeed to do error correction. Now, in these systems, uh, like uh, shown here in uh, quantum dots, it's possible because the ratio of uh, coherence or decoherence times and uh, switching times by now is uh, very large. It's, it's almost a factor of 10 to 5 or 10 to 6, <coughs> which uh, satisfies thresholds for error correction. Therefore, it's possible. And it's also here, I should mention uh, names. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Leo was an early player in the field and also Charlie and other people. But from the theory side, uh, definitely uh, Boris, Boris Altschul, and I think also Leonid here should be mentioned, you know, working on quantum dots before we started then to do work on this um, uh, focus more on spin, and that also brought us together for the first time in some program where we had uh, many, many nice uh, stories also in the Swiss Alps. But anyway, <coughs> so I just want to advertise this a little bit and keep that in mind because uh, many people argue now that the new path is a better path, namely topological quantum computing. And why is this so? The uh, idea here is that uh, basically you just uh, need to move in some uh, abstract space your particles around each other, and you can do this in a not very precise way, and therefore the system is much more resilient to errors. And uh, only counting the windings, so to speak, uh, can do the uh, calculation. Now, uh, here again a picture. Uh, you move particles around each other, and what is very important here that these particles need to have some non-abelian character, so if you rotate one around two and then two around three and you change the order, you don't get the same stuff. And this has to do with the fact that your particle must have some internal structure, spinor structure. And when you change uh, the uh, location, then you also mix up 
the uh, components. <coughs> so uh, that is the uh, idea behind uh, topological quantum computing. And at zero temperature, if you have a gap in the system, on paper at least, uh, this works uh, nice. However, when you go to real world, this is no longer the case. And actually, no matter how uh, small your temperature is compared to the gap, you will run into the problem that in the end, if you scale up your system, that the probability to get an error, one single error kills you, that you get the probability of order one when you scale up. And this has been ignored over many, many years, and it's only in recent time now that people have started to appreciate that this is really becoming a burning issue. <clears throat> also, in the field of topological quantum computing, you cannot do without error correction. And error correction uh, turns out to be a bigger problem because of the non-abelian character. And doing measurement of non-abelian excitations uh, turns out not to be very uh, straightforward. So here are already some first uh, attempts in these directions. <clears throat> And uh, very recently, uh, going now more to uh, the uh, field of Majorana fermions, uh, David DiVincenzo and his uh, group members uh, have shown that actually with the braiding scheme proposed for Majoranas, you have even a worse problem. <coughs> there is a problem of creating continuously errors. <coughs> so in this scheme, which has been uh, uh, proposed by Alisea and collaborators when you uh, move around, uh, in a quasi two-dimensional uh, location. So here there are two Majoranas here, two Majoranas in Ioana exchange. Then there are two uh, exchange paths from here to here, and the second one from here to here, where in between you do an error correction. Then you will end up with two results which are different. And the problem is that uh, quasi-particle excitations can happen during the braiding. And basically, uh, you know, in terms of a superconductor, you can think of a Cooper pair being taken out of the condensate, split into two quasi-particles. One quasi-particle is trapped and moved away. And uh, thereby, basically, you make a non-local error, a local error to a non-local error. And this happens all the time. And the bigger the system, the more probability that this happens. You will end up with or, uh, order one error. And therefore, uh, this clearly shows that uh, braiding alone cannot be the solution. You need, in the end, also uh, error correction. Nevertheless, it's uh, still an interesting scheme because uh, it might be that certain gates are better controllable than other gates in uh, traditional or in conventional uh, qubit uh, systems. So in the end, I would say the outlook is that probably we will end, uh, end up with some hybrid systems uh, and uh, in all systems we need uh, error correction. So error correction, just here as a very, very recent result uh, out of my group here, error correction can be done uh, also for these Majorana fermions, but now look at the threshold. The threshold is just uh, crazy. It's uh, 10 to minus 17 and uh, that tells you it's not optimized yet, this is just a proof of principle. And so we are going basically back 20 years in the field of conventional uh, quantum computing where the threshold was also very low and only over the years uh, refining then all these uh, barriers it was possible to uh, come to a reasonable value. So this is just to show that in principle it's possible with Majoranas but you do need uh, uh, this uh, error correction scheme. So there's still a lot of work I think ahead in this field. <coughs> there are other models uh, recently coming up, uh, for example the Kagome like this where you can do better and there you can even look at the parafermions, uh, these are fractionalized uh, Majorana fermions, more powerful and there the threshold uh, in such models can go even up uh, to higher values. But anyway, let me go back now to physics and uh, look more into the uh, question of where we can find such uh, excitations, bound states with uh, properties uh, that have spinors, moving them around, they change uh, the uh, components and uh, behave non-abelian-like. <coughs> so first proposals uh, go back here to uh, five half, fractional quantum hole states, probably the first uh, person to be acknowledged for Majoranas in trapped vortices or top, what is called now topological superconductivity is Wolowick, uh, who uh, found actually a very nice uh, solution of a uh, vortex in a chiral superconductor with a bound state in there which sits at zero. The only thing he didn't say in his paper, that it's a Majorana, but you find all solutions in there. The explicit wave function, everything. <coughs> and uh, this has been used then by Ivanov to show that you can do actually uh, uh, quantum computation with it. <coughs> and then uh, these kind of ideas have been extended to more concrete uh, systems in uh, semiconductor systems. Uh, uh, this was mentioned before. You can extend, and I just advertise this, you can extend the ideas of Majoranas and non obelian uh, particles also to other uh, uh, bound states. So they are complex fermions. They don't need to be Majoranas. Complex fermions, which you can break, they can also have actually non-abelian character. So this you find in this work here. 
Good, but anyway, in solid state, uh, we are interested here now basically to find bound states and uh, uh, bound states which have some internal structure which can be used then uh, in, the, in this context of uh, uh, braiding. So for this, I also would like to mention actually the simplest known bound state that uh, probably everyone should know from his uh, early days of quantum mechanics. It goes also back to a Russian scientist, to uh, Tom, and that's the Tom surface state. And here is the simplest model, <coughs> and this model contains actually very much of the physics which also uh, creeps up then in the uh, Majorana physics. So here's a hopping Hamiltonian on a lattice, uh, can be spinful or not, and there's a periodic modulation on that lattice uh, indicated here by these uh, blue uh, bars. And uh, if the period is chosen uh, to be commensurate or the same as the Fermi wavelength, so have the Fermi wavelength, we get Bragg reflection, gaps open, and, uh, or a pile gap uh, opens, and uh, within that pile gap at the end of the chain, we can get bound states. This depends a little bit on the phase uh, of the potential. If the potential starts with a positive uh, uh, value, of course, then you won't get the bound state. If it starts with a negative value, then you get the maximum of the bounds in the middle of the gap. So here's a spectrum. You just put this on a computer, diagonalize that, and here is the wave function localized left and right hand here. There are similar models which are more complicated, like the Su Schaefer Hager model, but I think that's the simplest one. And now take of this model the continuum limit <coughs> and uh, linearize the spectrum. So you take the continuum limit and you linearize around the Fermi points, and you end up with the Jackie Rabbi Hamiltonian. That's kind of surprising. It's a very simple uh, model to start with. And you end up with a class of uh, Hamiltonian, which uh, basically is at the heart of all these uh, topological phases, because there is a mass term in there which changes its sign at the origin. And whenever you have uh, a Dirac uh, uh, Hamiltonian with a mass changing uh, term, a tau refers to right and left goer basis. And uh, this mass term is related to the uh, periodic potential, changes sign at zero. You get a solid tone uh, there. And inside the solid tone, Landau Lifshitz, you know, you can find a bound state. And uh, this soliton or this bound state uh, in there has even fractional charge is a uh, E over 2. So this kind of uh, system is also interesting. Uh, here's the spectrum of this uh, bound state. The wave function looks like a Majorana wave function, by the way. And uh, here we have the charge density wave gap, and the bound state can lie somewhere in between. The bound state moves as a function of this uh, phase of the potential. And uh, if that uh, phase is positive, as I said in the beginning, then uh, the bound state moves out into continuum. If uh, you start with a minimum, then it moves in the middle of the gap, and there you have particle hole symmetry. And the big difference now of this state is that this state is not stable. So very small fluctuations will change the uh, energy, and uh, in terms of quantum computing, that's not good, because then you would have a state, if you have a superposition of these states, where the phase would fluctuate, and that leads to dephasing. So that's actually uh, one goal uh, in this field, to look for systems which have some stability against particle hole excitation such that you get a state which is pinned. It doesn't really mean that you need particle hole symmetry, but just some symmetry which pins the energy. So this leads then to, uh, for example, to Majorana fermions. There are some systems where you can see you get a direct transition, just changing parameters from such uh, complex fermions into a Majorana fermion. Now, a Majorana fermion, it has been uh, said here now very uh, uh, elaborately this morning several times, uh, has basic ingredients, S-wave superconductivity, and a spin texture. The spin texture is actually also well known, uh, can be provided by many different things, for example, uh, by uh, you know, domain walls of ferromagnets attached to a superconductor that uh, gives you a situation like this, or spin orbit interaction, rotating Seyman field, uh, and so forth. And another uh, mechanism which I will elaborate on later then is the uh, RKKY interaction in one dimensions, which also can lead to a spin texture. So again, here the spectrum, uh, the simple uh, rush by Hamiltonian, which uh, has only an effect if there is a magnetic field opening a gap. If there is not a magnetic field, then you can gauge away the uh, spin orbit, at least in infinite uh, size 1D system. It has absolutely no uh, effect. And this is what we call then a helical uh, spectrum. And as uh, Leo pointed out, it's actually not so easy to measure that gap. Uh, it would be nice uh, with uh, spectroscopic methods, for example, or, for example, when you couple it to a, uh, <coughs> uh, to a nuclear spins, Coringa laws, density of states change, and so forth. Uh, there are some proposals to look for it, but uh, it's still an open uh, question. So the experiments have been mentioned uh, based on this uh, system here, and uh, how do we find... Uh, it's actually a recipe to find bound states, and to some extent there is one, uh, the recipe is you need two mechanisms 
which open a gap in your system, and these two mechanisms need to compete with each other. And uh, this, uh, you know, with this kind of uh, insight, you can find actually many systems uh, behaving like that. Here in this uh, standard model, what is the uh, uh, competition? It's the competition between the Seyman gap in the Rashba competing with superconductivity. And they compete in a different way. So at uh, k equals zero, it's the difference between the two gap mechanisms which uh, uh, determine this gap here, where outside it's just superconductivity. And because of this, you can close the gap and reopen the gap and then uh, change the uh, symmetry of the state. And uh, this leads them from non-topological to topological superconductivity, as uh, first pointed out by Wolowick. And uh, this has been discussed actually in 2D. we has been orbited in great detail by Sato and Fujimoto, and then was applied to 1D uh, by uh, these two uh, uh, groups here. And there are a number of uh, very nice experiments. Uh, I think the most important one certainly is the one by uh, Leo, which is depicted here. Now, let me uh, tell you a little bit more about the internal structure of a Majorana, because this turns out to be a very important uh, ingredient for later. <coughs> so here, uh, again, there is this uh, Rashba spectrum. Magnetic field opens a gap at k equals zero and competes with superconductivity. So this is the whole part, uh, the dashed line above it. And the uh, superconductivity also opens a gap here. Now, in a certain regime, basically, you can treat the outer uh, Fermi level and the inner one as independent. Linearize around those points and uh, written down like this here. So one has an oscillatory factor coming from here and from here. This uh, Fermi uh, momentum is uh, equal to the spin orbit. And then you get two branches. <coughs> These branches uh, are kind of Dirac-like and you can solve them and you find then the uh, full solution to your problem containing four components. And here's the solution of a Majorana fermion, which has four components, spin up, spin down, and the whole part here in number representation. And this here is coming from the internal part, k equals zero, no oscillation, just a decaying part, whereas the outer from exterior branch, uh, you get an oscillatory contribution and another decay part. And this decay uh, uh, contribution here defines the localization length of your Majoranas, and they are two. There are two, and the longest one uh, uh, will then be uh, uh, dominated by the shortest one, and it depends then on the ratio of superconductivity, proximity superconductivity, to a Seyman field. So here are two examples with these uh, uh, oscillations, Friedel-like oscillations, just the uh, beating between the two contributions, and the decay here of the wave function, which is actually not a simple exponential. And this turns out to be important for the experiment I will uh, describe later. Good. Now, when you have overlap of the Majoranas, as uh, Leo pointed out, then uh, basically the uh, uh, Majoranas split away from zero, but you have these oscillations in there, and these oscillations mean you have to come back to zero, because you have Fermi oscillations and they go, Friedel oscillations, they go to zero, and that's why the uh, uh, thing here oscillates as a function of magnetic field, because as a function of magnetic field, you change the Fermi momentum, becomes longer, and you also increase the overlap, so the amplitude becomes bigger, so the distance between the nodes increases and the amplitude becomes bigger, uh, at least in this uh, simple model. And uh, this is then uh, the prediction. I think so far this uh, is still, uh, uh, we are waiting for experimental confirmation uh, of uh, this uh, type of behavior. So it's July 2012. It? Oh, so no self-consistency, self yeah. That yeah. Much. Right, right. So well, okay, to some extent, yeah. <coughs> okay, good. Uh, Charlie saw some uh, oscillations in his data, uh, Churchill et al., and uh, these oscillations, they plotted uh, on this uh, uh, curve here. This is the red one. If you compare, compare this now with the simple Majorana picture I just showed before, then definitely they do not agree. So the oscillations seen in Charlie's uh, earlier experiment, they must come from somewhere else. We still don't understand this. It might be orbital uh, oscillations coming from orbital degrees of freedom, higher bands, or so forth. Good. So, <coughs> But uh, there's a very important uh, point to make, and I think Leo is going in that direction. If you increase the spin-orbit interaction, this is just from the simulation, then the bands flatten out, and also the, uh, 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 the field range before the oscillation starts uh, is shifted further and further out, and the amplitude becomes smaller. So this could also mean that uh, if you have large spin-orbit, several uh, milli-electron volts, here we assumed about 5 MeV, then uh, the oscillation is also suppressed and it takes longer and longer to get it visible. So maybe Leo, still waiting. 
Okay, good. So it's difficult uh, to measure that gap directly, uh, but uh, you hope. Is spin orbit interaction a necessary uh, ingredient in this story? And uh, no, because uh, as uh, Leonid already pointed out this morning, you can make it actually by yourself. And uh, basically, this is based on a, a simple gauge transformation. Uh, you uh, uh, change your uh, 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 state of the, of, the, of the state wave vector, which is uh, by spin-dependent uh, unitary transformation. And that transforms a spectrum of Rushba type into a spectrum like this, where you have now a rotating field, a Seyman field like this, with the pitch uh, given by the spin orbit uh, lengths. And the two parabolas are on top of each other, where half of the spectrum is gapped here. It's not completely equivalent from an experimental point of view. If you start with this one, then this is somewhat simpler to couple to because you don't have this problem with Zener uh, tunneling uh, of states from the lead into the system. So here's an example. Uh, if you use the separation between nanomagnets to create such a uh, rotating magnetic field, then this distance between the nanomagnets defines this uh, KSO. And therefore, you can see you can get uh, very easily on a scale, if this is 200 nanometers separate, which is easy to do these days, you get a spin orbit a scale of uh, tens or even 100 uh, MeV in some extreme limit. OK, now I come to the uh, last type of uh, 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 tuning. And uh, that is the following problem. And uh, Leonid already alluded to this. In the game which we play here with the Rushba uh, uh, gap, the spin orbit interaction is a fixed parameter. Also, the Fermi energy typically is a fixed parameter. That means the density of your system. And what you have to do from an experimental point of view, you have to tune your chemical potential such that you are inside this gap. So you deplete your system, you apply very high voltage, and uh, because the, typically the spin orbit is, uh, is small, you have to go very low, very low in the density. You go down to the bottom, and of course, if there's disorder, then uh, your system will be very uh, sensitive to that. So this prompts the question, is it possible to get a system which you don't need to tune, which does it basically by itself, uh, the uh, Fermi level given, and the system opens it gap, its gap around the Fermi level. And this is what I would like to uh, convince you now, that this is indeed a uh, way uh, systems can choose in one dimension. So here, it's, uh, for example, if you have a uh, magnetic uh, helix, then as I showed before, you open this uh, partial gap. And now it's possible that, uh, or it's, uh, it's a fact, that this helix acts uh, back on the system, and that's the reason why it opens a gap. And uh, that uh, leaves then half of the modes uh, open. And uh, the question is, can this also happen in a system with superconductivity in there? So where the carriers actually are uh, decaying on a, on a certain length scale, uh, the correlation lengths. By the way, this is an effect which we believe uh, has some uh, 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 experimental uh, 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 Validity. So there's an experiment on gallium arsenide uh, quantum wires by uh, uh, Dominic Zumbühl, uh, done on uh, uh, material he got from Amir Jacobi. Uh, uh, Amir used that uh, type of system to measure conductance and lattice liquid uh, properties in that system. And there, indeed, they see when they lower uh, the system that the gap is opened uh, by itself, a uh, semi-gap, and uh, therefore the conductance reduces then as a function of temperature from 2 e squared over h to 1 e squared over h and stays then at that value. <coughs> and that has to do a lot with interaction effects. And that uh, leads a little bit back to what Leo is saying. Uh, interaction effects play a very important role. And the interaction effects, they actually enhance the size of the gap strongly. But anyway, uh, in recent years, uh, people have started to look into artificially man-made chains on the surface of uh, some materials. For example, here is an example from Wiesendanger's group in Hamburg, where they looked at uh, iridium and placed gadolinium atoms uh, one by one, or basically by sputtering, they self-organized on the surface. And uh, deduced then from uh, uh, STM measurement with uh, magnetic tips that there must be some helical structure, spin structure, uh, in these systems. And this uh, formed, uh, I think, kind of a motivation for uh, a number of people to look into this. And uh, uh, Leonid uh, talked about that uh, experiment by uh, the Princeton group, Ali Astani's uh, experiment, where they uh, basically did the same, but uh, they took lead and put uh, iron on top of it. And uh, lead uh, goes then into a superconducting uh, phase below 9 or 8 uh, Kelvin. And now for this system, I would like to uh, present now in the remaining time some alternative uh, scenario which uh, differs slightly from what uh, Leonid uh, told you this morning. 
And uh, that's a theory which we worked out, actually also with uh, Ali. And a similar uh, work was done then independently at the same time by uh, Braunecker, Simon, and Vatsivi and Franz. Good. Uh, just to uh, set the stage here, the uh, parameters of the problem. Actually, I had a slide. Let me see. I want to come back to this. Yeah, just very briefly. <clears throat> so here uh, we have a uh, wire or a chain of atoms, and each atom has a magnetic moment. Let's say a spin 5 half or 3 half in, uh, in iron. And we place that on top of an S-wave superconductor. Uh, I will always assume that the Fermi wavelength in the wire, in the wire itself, is larger than the lattice constant. And we have interaction between the localized moments, not direct one, but interaction which is transmitted by itinerant electrons. So a standard situation of uh, uh, RKQI, Rudemann, Kittel, and so forth. So here is the interaction Hamiltonian, beta is the interaction constant or exchange constant. Uh, I will later call it J here, sorry, this uh, label change. And uh, I is the localized spin at side uh, I here. Sigma is the spin of the itinerant electron. And now here we integrate out the electrons to perturbation expansion in lowest order in uh, beta or in beta over Fermi energy. And uh, we end up then with the standard uh, RKQI Hamiltonian, which is quadratic in the coupling, uh, beta squared, uh, some area factor here, and uh, spin, spin interaction, localized spin interaction, and the spin interaction is determined by the uh, spin susceptibility. And uh, the spin susceptibility uh, is actually quite well known. It's a spin susceptibility you can calculate for many uh, systems, but in particular it also can be calculated for superconduct uh, superconducting S-wave systems, has been done uh, previously by Aprikosov and other people, and uh, I think it goes back actually to Anderson and Sewell, who uh, pointed out that you cannot have a ferromagnetic order in a superconductor uh, attached uh, to a ferromagnet because uh, the uh, uh, RKQI gets cut off at the length scale, which is longer than the coherence length, and therefore you cannot uh, establish correlations which go beyond that. And that is uh, signaled then by the fact that in Fourier space, the Q equals zero mode uh, has to vanish. However, you still have the peak around uh, 2KF, which is very characteristic for one-dimensional systems. This is very different from 2D and 3D, where you don't have a uh, peak at uh, 2KF. And this peak gets uh, <coughs> uh, cut by superconductivity, but it's not zero. It's a logarithmic, uh, basically a logarithmic uh, divergence here, uh, cut by, uh, uh, or, or determined by uh, the ratio of uh, gap over uh, Fermi energy of the, of the material. But it's still large enough to give you uh, much weight in this sum, such that finite Q gives you the main contribution for the ground state property of that Hamiltonian. And that means it's a helix. So the helix minimizes uh, the energy here. Now, interaction effects can then even stabilize this uh, uh, more. I will ignore this for the moment. <clears throat> and so you get a helix at momentum 2KF. And that is the ingredient which acts now back as a field to the spins. And it's this field which will open partial gaps. And the pitch of this helix is exactly at the Fermi momentum. That means, you know, what we had before as two different parameters, the spin orbit, KSO, and KF, they are identical here. So I don't need to tune. <coughs> Good. So here is again then the spectrum. Uh, just cut. This goes over here. And uh, I see then... Uh, the partial gap uh, opened at the two Fermi momentum, and uh, this uh, is then basically the, uh, playing the role, this delta M, uh, this field produced by the helix of uh, the Seemann field. I get competition between superconductivity and this uh, helical Seemann field, and uh, I can go into a uh, topological phase. So the uh, only thing to be required is that this here is satisfied, that the field produced by the helical field, the field strength, is larger than the proximity gap in my uh, system, and then I'm in the uh, uh, topological phase. So we can go through some numbers uh, for chains, for magnetic wires, uh, nuclear wires. Uh, it depends on the coupling strengths, what the uh, crossover temperature will be. And uh, it was this here, which uh, was actually uh, written down before the experiment of Ali, where we got some uh, ideas about the order of magnitude. What is very different uh, in our case is the uh, assumption of the coupling strengths of the exchange compared to what uh, uh, Ali's uh, uh, interpretation is doing now. Maybe I have 
a slide here with uh, parameters of the problem. So there's the uh, superconducting order parameter, <coughs> there's chemical potential in the metal, and there's the exchange interaction. There's tunneling, tunneling inside the superconductor, tunneling inside the atomic chain, and between the uh, atomic chain and the superconductor. And our limit here is that uh, the tunneling between the, uh, uh, between the superconductor and the chain is a small parameter, is small. So it's a weak coupling, and uh, the uh, tunneling within the chain itself, and uh, of course within the superconductor is a larger parameter, and the exchange is much smaller than the chemical potential in the, uh, in the superconductor. So this distinguishes us uh, from, uh, from uh, this morning's talk of uh, Leonid. They work more in this limit here. <coughs> Good. Now let me come to some experiments. So just to say, you know, there, there are DFD calculation to this early experiment by the Wiesendanger group, and uh, here this gives you values of this uh, effective uh, RKQI interaction, if you interpret like this, which are also in this uh, milli-electron volt range, not electron volt range. <coughs> Good. So uh, you've heard about uh, Ali's uh, experiment. I will basically jump over it because it's interpreted in terms of Shiba states and tell you about a similar experiment which was done in, uh, at my university in the group of uh, Ernst Meyer, where basically they did the same. They also took a uh, uh, lead uh, and uh, put iron on it, forms uh, self-organized uh, uh, self chains which are depicted here. There's one additional experimental feature which they could measure in, uh, in Basel, not measured elsewhere else, is uh, uh, AFM, atomic force microscope of the chain. And you see here a picture of a iron chain on that uh, surface. Just to t uh, tell you, this is a uh, very, very nice tool. So for example, here uh, I have a picture from uh, Ernst uh, where they measure, for example, an uh, atomic force microscope of a graphene nanoribbon. And uh, here, for example, a boron doped uh, graphene nanoribbon. So you get very atomistic resolution with an AFM. And uh, what you see here is indeed a single uh, atom. <coughs> now, here coming back to uh, LED uh, 110 uh, surface, uh, and then, uh, you know, here's the recipe how you do it. And uh, you get these uh, rows uh, of, uh, of LED and uh, then uh, you measure the uh, uh, gap in the system. So this is a measurement, uh, SDM measurement of uh, the gap, and uh, that uh, allows you to use then a value in lead on the order of uh, one milli electron volt. And uh, then you put uh, iron on, on the system, uh, and with some annealing uh, trick, then uh, they get this uh, kind of uh, many, many uh, irons, and uh, with some uh, chunk, they believe this is uh, lead on top of these uh, iron wires. So here's now a picture of uh, uh, SDM, and there are two types of wires. One where you see a kind of a uh, blob at the end of the wire, and uh, some wires without. And uh, here, uh, the uh, trace of that. And you also, they also measure then, of course, the uh, DIDV uh, of this uh, blob, and uh, see a zero bias peak emerging here uh, in the middle. <coughs> And uh, now the question is, what is this zero bias peak? There could be many reasons, and uh, what they measured now was uh, to look along the wire. So here, again, a comparison between the STM measurement and the AFM measurement. And I should uh, uh, point out now, there is a very significant difference in uh, measurement and interpretation of these wires compared to the Princeton wires. Namely, the uh, spacing of the iron deduced from uh, this data here is about uh, the same as in, uh, as in lead itself. It's 0.37 nanometer. If you remember what uh, Leonid was quoting, it was more than four. So it's about uh, 0.4. So it's about the factor of 10 or 15 percent difference between what you would deduce from an STM measurement compared to an AFM measurement on the same wire. This has to do with the fact, and it's apparently well known in the field, that STM is not very faithful to the atomistic structure. Whereas uh, it's believed that the AFM gives you a more reliable structure of the uh, atoms lying uh, there. <coughs> Good. What is also interesting is to see this uh, halo at the end of the wire. And uh, the complete physical origin, how this works, how an AFM, if this is indeed a Majorana fermion, uh, has this enhancement uh, we still don't understand. Okay, so now you can do a measurement at uh, 5 Kelvin. You can do a measurement at 10 Kelvin when superconductivity is gone in the, in the lead, and then uh, the peaks here disappear. 
And uh, now let's uh, see whether we can uh, bring this in uh, some uh, understanding in, in terms of Majorana wave functions. So the Majorana wave function I uh, described before, I can use now for this system, I do an interpretation of what I uh, described to you before with the uh, uh, kind of the strong spin orbit limit or when I have a field. And there are two contributions uh, of localization, a short and a long one, and this oscillatory part. And each localization length is characterized by parameters, Fermi velocity, uh, 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 proximity gap, and this uh, internal field produced by the spiral minus the uh, proximity gap. If this is the case, then we are in the game for Majorana, and uh, now we can see if this plays through self-consistently if we try to fit now the data. And uh, here, uh, first we get from the data, uh, I should show this, so uh, here's the data along the wire, and uh, as a function of distance, and the first thing is this black one at 5 Kelvin, it oscillates, and the gray one at the bottom here is at 10 Kelvin where superconductivity has gone. And so you see these oscillations, these oscillations are Fourier transformed, and you see these are 2KF oscillations, which uh, are seen then in this wire, and uh, this gives you a Fermi wavelength which corresponds to about four times the lattice constant. Okay, and then there is a decay, and uh, this decay could not be fit with uh, one exponential only. And this was actually the first reason why uh, we went back uh, to look, uh, or they asked us, and uh, we had a closer look, and uh, uh, used then this uh, double exponential. And so there are now two exponentials which are uh, uh, fit to this curve, and this uh, exponentials allows us then uh, to get, uh, so we know delta, we know the Fermi velocity from the oscillations, and uh, from this then we can get the information about uh, this uh, intrinsic gap to which we have no direct access, this delta m. So these decay lengths are about 100 nanometer and uh, about one nanometer. And this gives us then uh, these scales here, so the uh, same for the data, this is another wire, uh, similar data, and uh, we find now for this uh, uh, field produced by the helix a value of about 50 milli electron volt. So this is what corresponds to J, to this uh, exchange. And uh, this needs to be set in contrast to what uh, the Princeton group assumes, they assume for J, two electron volts. So it's about a factor of almost 100 in difference in, uh, in strength. So it's really a completely different regime. Uh, everything seems to be self-consistent. The number which we get out is such that uh, all the conditions which are used to derive this Majorana picture are satisfied. They are respected. Now a question remains, is, uh, is there a helix? And uh, I think Leonid made the statement that there is no helix because of measurements of the Princeton group, but uh, these measurements are also not uh, completely unambiguous because you could have a helix which uh, does this here, and it's very close to ferromagnetic order. You would not see the difference. There are other helixes as possible. Uh, Spin-orbit interaction can also play a role because spin-orbit interaction breaks the symmetry. The helix I'm talking about can still be in any plane, uh, can be in that plane or can be in that plane, and spin orbit can break then uh, one plane and pick out one. <coughs> okay, so uh, this basically uh, leads me to a summary of this part, uh, just saying that monatomic chains can be structured in, in 1D, and uh, there is some agreement between experiment uh, and uh, this theoretical understanding, and it seems to be kind of uh, self-consistent. Spin helixes in similar systems have been seen before, gadolinium on iridium, so it's not such a uh, total surprise that this can also happen here. Uh, there are open issues. So, for example, the experiment did not look at the B field dependencies, uh, length dependencies. Uh, they should go to lower temperature. The uh, experiment was done at 5 Kelvin. And uh, from the theory, we do not really understand how the AFM signal comes about. This very, you know, very nice uh, halo, because it's a force microscope. And now you have to ask yourself so, what does a Majorana actually, uh, you know, how does it talk to such an AFM and, and lead to such a signal if, if it's a Majorana? So I would say, okay, there are, uh, there's a consistent interpretation, whether uh, in the end it holds up to other interpretations at the moment, we don't know of anyone, but uh, at least this is the picture as we uh, see it at the moment. How much time do I have left? Oh, uh, actually I just added this slide because of Boris's question at the end of uh, Leonid's talk. <laughs> So, so here, you know, this goes back to this uh, alternative regime where you have very strong exchange and you get Shiba states. And uh, in the Shiba state uh, problem, there is one feature more, which uh, Leonid did not mention, it's also well known, that actually the gap under the Shiba state gets very much affected. 
and the gap closes under the Shiba state, and then the parity can change. So basically, you can trap one, one, one spin, you can break apart the Cooper pair, and you can localize one spin, and the parity changes. And this leads to a quantum phase transition. So here's a numerical simulation as a function of the exchange coupling. And uh, for a long time, uh, you know, not much happens to the gap. So you, this you can actually uh, treat analytically, as was done earlier by uh, Rusinov and other people. And uh, then when you come with J to a value when it's comparable to the Fermi energy of the metal, then you jump. And this is the point where the Shiba state reaches uh, uh, zero energy. And that's the point when, uh, when, you know, when it becomes interesting to look at the Shiba bands. And at this point, also the nature of the Shiba state can actually change. And uh, Shiba state being defined as a bound state inside the gap changes its character after the quantum phase transition, if you go a little bit further, then the Shiba state in energy vanishes and is above, and it's so to speak in the normal region, and then it has an extended part, and then you can call it an Andreev bound state. And uh, it goes on the story, if you have several of those, then they can overlap and you can actually form an Andreev band. So I think uh, you know, it's definitely uh, something, and, and uh, there's more uh, we are looking at here. <coughs> Good. What is beyond Majorana fermions, uh, I will not be allowed to tell you. Uh, I think I have reached now uh, the end of my time. Thank you very much for your attention.